Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ambassador Sharon Wilkinson, and I'm one of the uh, national board members. And it's my pleasure to introduce our panel this afternoon. The question is posed, is there a responsibility to protect? When the community of sovereign nations sees evidence of genocide, of war crimes, of ethnic cleansing, or of crimes against humanity, what should it do? The report of the World Summit of 2005 boldly concluded that when a state is quote unquote man manifestly failing to protect its population from the crimes that I listed, then the international community was prepared to take collective action through the UN Security Council and in accordance with the UN Charter. Five years later, we are still challenged to make the right decisions to effectuate definitive actions. Our panelists this afternoon are supremely well qualified to bring this vexing issue to our attention and to look at it, not just by their academic preparation, but by their actual hands-on experience. The moderator is Dr. Pauline Baker. Pauline Baker is with the Fund for Peace, a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. that's dedicated to preventing war and alleviating the conditions that cause conflict. Dr. Baker is currently a professorial lecturer at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and formerly taught as an adjunct professor at the Graduate School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. She has extensive, extensive experience in Africa and also on Capitol Hill. And she is an expert on the failed state index. Ambassador Stephen Rapp is the ambassador at large for war crimes issues. Prior to his appointment, which occurred in 2009, he served as prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone where he led prosecutions of former Liberian President Charles Taylor and other persons alleged to bear the greatest responsibility for the atrocities committed during the Civil War in Sierra Leone. Prior to that, Ambassador Rapp served as a senior trial attorney and chief of prosecutions at the International uh, Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Monica Serrano, <coughs> Dr. Serrano, is the executive director of the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect. The Global Center was formed in 2008 to give legs to the conclusions of the World Summit in 2005. And perhaps Dr. Silano will talk to us about that. She is, um, she's also a professor of international relations at El Colegio de Mexico and is a senior research associate at the Center for International Studies. It is with great pleasure that I turn over the discussion of this issue to our most supremely qualified panel. Thanks very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much. I think we're going to get right into it by first talking a little bit about this concept of a funny name, R2P. Um, and I want to give you just a little bit of a background on it uh, before we open it up. Uh, for decades, if not centuries, sovereign states used its, their, their concept of sovereignty to uh, protect themselves from any criticism, if there was any, or any intervention, if there was any, uh, for abuses that were, uh, that they actually uh, perpetrated against their own citizens. And the norm was that there would be non-intervention in the affairs of other states. And that is certainly a principle that has governed the UN uh, since its founding. Um, what has arisen is a new norm which challenges that old norm that says, well, yes, all nations are sovereign, but sovereignty has another side. And the other side is that they have an obligation if they're sovereign to protect their citizens. So the norm uh, emerged that sovereignty is in fact responsibility, not just uh, authority. Uh, and that that kind of responsibility has uh, real meaning. Uh, 
this is a very controversial concept, and before we get into it, uh, I just want to tell you about the structure of this concept. It's, it's said to have had three pillars. Um, the first pillar is that state has a responsibility to protect its population from genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and ethnic cleansing. Those four crimes are specifically laid out. The second pillar is that if the state is unable to protect its population on its own, the international community has a responsibility to assist the state by building its capacity. This can mean building early warning capabilities, mediating conflicts between political parties, strengthening the security sector, mobilizing standby forces, and many other actions. The third pillar states that if the state is manifestly failing to protect its citizens from mass atrocities and peaceful measures are not working, the international community has the responsibility to intervene at first diplomatically, then more coercively, and as a last resort with military force. So it completely turns on its head the old norm of non-intervention in the affairs of sovereign states. So with that as a background, I'd like to turn to Monica and ask her to give us some background as to how this norm evolved and uh, what, our, uh, what more has to be done to, to make it uh, effective. Thank you. Well, as you rightly pointed out, the norm is now conceived around a three pillar strategy that very much draws on the strategy outlined by the Secretary General in his report published last year. And this means a significant change from the earlier version of the norm, which was that coined by a commission, a Canadian commission, which was uh, known by the acronym ISIS, that uh, basically so the norm as applying to large loss of life, but did not confine the norm to the four crimes that uh, were then endorsed in the 205 World Summit Outcome document. So as we've seen, then the norm has evolved significantly from 201, when it was first coined by the ISIS Commission, to 205, when it was confined to the crimes, to 209, when it was then translated into a three-pillar strategy. You mentioned that the norm is still controversial. The controversy around the norm is very much linked to the association of the norm, the association of the norm Ongoing, sovereignty should be uh, marginalized and an immediate response should be deployed. The ISIS Commission precisely tried to address this question and through the participation of key members of the Commission, notably Mohamed Sanou, co chair of the Commission, put the emphasis on the notion of prevention, which in a way provided the inspiration for complementarity that we will be hearing uh, subsequently uh, about. So, the responsibility to protect us is now understood by member states and is now uh, embodied in the Secretary General's report. <laughs> it's not a one moment response. It is a broad agenda which very much speaks to three moments in which the state is perceived to be responsible. If the state is in difficulties, the state itself should ask for help. And the international community should in turn come forward and provide help. But it's not in any way an automatic sequence. And the idea that the only response should be a military response, which is very much the idea that is associated with the principle of humanitarian intervention, is no longer present in the understanding of the responsibility to protect, and is fundamental to understand the legitimacy that this emerging norm enjoys, and the very important shifts that we've seen in terms of attitudes and values towards mass atrocity prevention. So what we've seen in two sessions in the General Assembly, a formal debate last year in 2009, and an informal dialogue on early warning and assessment just this past August, is a broadening of the consensus around the notion of the responsibility to 
a diminishing of the number of countries objecting to R2P, we are still facing a very uh, vocal, hardcore minority, but it's a handful of states. And we, what we have seen uh, through the work of the center and the work of the Special Advisors for Genocide Prevention <coughs> and the responsibility <coughs> to protect is that we are really talking about a much more complex picture in which, yes, we have a small minority, but the universe of supporters is expanding and is very clearly signaling this shift in political attitudes and priorities. In the 2009 session, a very important and significant shift was the one that came from countries like India, a very significant actor in the international scene right now, and Egypt. Both countries had been perceived as opponents in earlier sessions and in the period in which the norm, this emerging norm, was eclipsed through the impact of the war on terror. The statement delivered by India and by Egypt showed the readiness and their understanding of the relevance, the urgency of this agenda, and the readiness to take the steps to create the capacities and the normative foundations that could then uh, provide a successful avenue for the implementation of the norm. Thank you very much. Uh, Steve, maybe you could comment on what this means for the international justice system. Well, there really is a relationship between uh, the responsibility to protect and, and international criminal law. Recently, uh, at a forum in New York, uh, ministers, one uh, minister said, these two developments are probably the most significant things to develop in the international system in the, in the post-Cold War era. Uh, and I think as we look at international criminal justice, and we talk about concepts like complementarity, uh, we see the, uh, the impact of, of international criminal justice ideas on the development of the responsibility to protect. And I think it gives us some ideas about its you know, actually operationalizing it. Um, people say international criminal justice began at Nuremberg and uh, in uh, two weeks from Sunday, the commemoration of Nuremberg at a forward of being there, repeating the great words of, of Justice Jackson and, and what happened at Nuremberg was of, of immense importance. In, in terms of holding the leaders to account. Uh, but uh, people, I think, in reflecting on Nuremberg sometimes forget one of the limitations there. And that was, of course, it dealt with the, crime, the crimes against uh, peace, uh, aggression, but it did deal with the atrocities, there's no question, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, but in the statute of the Nuremberg Tribunal, uh, the only war crimes they were concerned about are those involving international armed conflict and only crimes against the people in terms of civilians of occupied states. And when it came to crimes against humanity, an idea that the Nuremberg Statute grew out of international custom in a very historic way, uh, crimes of violence and murder against uh, a civilian populations as part of a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian populations, Nuremberg required that those acts be tied to uh, the international armed conflict. Uh, so that when the judgment was returned for crimes against humanity for those leaders involved in the mass murder of the Jews of Europe, uh, the, the mass murder of the Jews of Poland or Russia, etc., were part of that conviction. But the mass murder of 180,000 German Jews uh, was, was no part of, of the basis for the conviction set at Nuremberg. Uh, of course, there was little development in international criminal justice during the, uh, uh, during the, uh, the Cold War era. But then we have the, the atrocities of, of, uh, of the Yugoslavia, uh, of the ex-Yugoslavia breakup of, 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 of that federal republic and, and the atrocities that involved uh, the murder of, of tens of thousands, the rape of, of, of thousands. And, and the world responded uh, with the Chapter 7 resolution in the, in the, in the Security Council uh, that uh, essentially tracked Nuremberg. And, and require that for convictions for crimes against humanity to be a tie to the international armed conflict. That changed uh, the following year uh, when with hundreds of thousands of people murdered in Rwanda in a non-international armed conflict, uh, which of course involved in genocide, which is a, a new offense that had been defined under the Genocide Convention of 48. But when it came to crimes against humanity, it no longer required uh, any sort of international uh, aspect of, of, 
of the conflict uh, or of, of those crimes. And in, and in 1998, uh, when the world met at Rome to, to write the statutes of the International Criminal Court uh, and wrote the war crimes and genocide and, and crimes against humanity into the into this statute, uh, there was no requirement of, of crimes against humanity as being part of an international conflict. I know our own position in the United States uh, opposed the, uh, the, the statute of Rome on, for a number of reasons having to do with the exercise of jurisdiction, but there was absolute unanimity when it came uh, to the definition of these crimes. Indeed, our American career Marine Bill Pizzao, who's uh, now in another position in the Pentagon, uh, was actually the author uh, of the draftsman of, 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 of a number of the key provisions, and, and in the end, the draftsman of all of the elements of the crime. So the whole world recognized that this was, that these, uh, that these crimes could occur within a single nation, uh, within, you know, against the people of, a, of one country within their borders, and they could be of international concern. And now we see with the uh, International Criminal Court situation open in Kenya, involving the murder of 1,133 people, not in a civil war, not in an armed conflict, inter not international in scope, or certainly not international, but of the atrocities based on ethnicity or, 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 or political basis. 1,100 people killed, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands displaced. The crimes within a single country. And the ICC has now opened, at least as a preliminary examination, the killing of about 150 people in a stadium in, in Guinea in September of, of 2009. Uh, and it may, uh, and we hope, uh, 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 stand back from that and the national system can proceed. But I, but I think we're, we're seeing here the, the idea uh, that what happens within a single country uh, can be the subject of, of international prosecution. Now, in this responsibility to protect, uh, of course, we're talking about prevention. And, and as, as you noted earlier in our discussion, uh, you know, protect prevention and sort of prosecution after the fact are two different things. Uh, but there is a relationship. Uh, in my hometown in Iowa, the police have on the side of their doors a, a symbol and then uh, we protect and, and serve. And, and generally that doesn't mean that they come and stop the crime in the process of happening. We hope that they could, but they often don't. Generally what they do is to chase up the person who did it afterwards. And, and bring them to justice. And by the fact that you have a system that enables that, you deter those crimes uh, in, in the first place. So there, there is that, uh, that relationship. Uh, the responsibility to protect, of course, uh, as we noted earlier, is very controversial in the sense that many people uh, view it, uh, and, and I think this attitude is shifting. There were some antipathies as it being viewed as a justification for sort of immediate military intervention for humanitarian basis. The emphasis is very much on, on the state's responsibility to protect and on increasing its capacity. And in that, it tracks the idea of complementarity in the ICC and in international law, which is that you really want to have the state where the crime is committed to prosecute, but there's often an absence of capacity or an absence of will, particularly where it's capacity. Uh, the, the role of the international community should be to reinforce that capacity, make it possible for them to do it themselves. Perhaps by standing off stage, maybe not a 900 pound gorilla, maybe not quite that strong, you may, in the process of them knowing that it could come to the international level, uh, encourage them to have the will to, to actually uh, do it. But, uh, but I think the emphasis uh, is, is very much on trying to have these things done at the national level. Now as we proceed to operationalize, and this is a slow process of operationalizing, of this, this concept, and there have been these debates in New York in, in the last August, and again, uh, again this August, uh, and, and to some extent, uh, uh, some of the controversy is coming out of this idea. The focus now is to a large extent on trying to gather the information uh, and to analyze information about emerging situations of atrocity. And I think this fits very well with, with an idea that, you know, myself who's followed the Rwanda genocide very closely, uh, thinks it's extremely important that as these crimes develop, the world needs to know what's happened. They need to know who's responsible. I think one of the most effective things, and not much effective, was done by the international community and by the United States during the Rwanda genocide. But I remember when Cruz Bushmill uh, at one time announced that, that we know what you're doing, I understand he's a moon chief of staff and the Rwanda military. We know what you're doing in this practice, so we're watching, et cetera. And that did, for a period of time, you know, sort of call them to pull back. 
they stay continued, but to be able to know what's going on and to call it down, and now with the, the principle that there can be uh, international prosecutions for these crimes, uh, that actually having that information at our disposal and being able to speak to it may uh, reinforce the deterrence of international criminal justice and prevent the crimes in the first place. Monica, has this principle actually been involved in any concrete situation, or is it still emerging? It is, as you <coughs> rightly pointed out, a principle, a principle like that. the status of the responsibility to protect us and norm, I would suggest is still in an emerging phase uh, and in the process of being consolidated, either through its institutionalization and there are avenues for that, very clearly in, the, in this country, the creation of an office and the appointment of a number of officials charged with dealing with uh, war crimes and mass atrocities, including the ambassador, signals the institutionalization of the principled ideas around the responsibility to protect. In the UN, there are parallel processes going on trying to establish an institutional form for the responsibility to protect. And there is also an initiative that the Global Center has been fostering and has succeeded in persuading two countries with very uh, outstanding credentials in terms of legitimacy, gender, who had uh, a very impressive record in terms of protecting its own population in, during the years of the Holocaust, and Ghana, that is also in Africa, a country that has been uh, willing to show that sovereignty cannot be used as a shield to abuse its own population. And this initiative is calling for the creation of national coordinating units, national focal points, very much uh, in the sense of what we've seen uh, in, in the US. So what is the status of the norm? It's still emerging. There is still some lingering concerns about the norm, including from supporters uh, that, uh, as is the case with other human rights norms, there is a fear of misuse, there is a fear of abuse, and there is a fear also of double standards and uh, selectivity. Has it been used? Has it been applied? We have, uh, many of you may have heard about Kenya, a case that has already been mentioned, as a relevant case for the responsibility to protect. And it was not, the principle was not mentioned or invoked during the crisis that loomed in Kenya a couple of years ago. But I had the chance to speak to Koti Annan and he said how in his determination to respond swiftly to events in Kenya, he had in the back of his mind the notion of the responsibility to protect as prompting him to take and to persuade other actors to take swift action to stop an event and, and a number of incidents that could very easily drive Kenya into a very catastrophic scenario. We have also heard the application of the norm to cases which have then been uh, rejected as uh, being relevant for the norm, very clearly the uh, cyclone in Myanmar, the Sirti cyclone in Myanmar, which created a debate and a controversy about whether climate change and natural disasters should or not apply to the norm. The consensus was then very clearly the, the center again, but also the special advisor for the responsibility to protect spoke publicly saying, no, the norm does not apply to natural disasters. It's a norm that is confined to the crimes that are the result, as Ambassador has already mentioned, of systematic and widespread intention. Therefore, if you have a natural disaster, it's only if the country, by uh, denying access, and in the process of denying access, creating the conditions for a large loss uh, of life, large scale loss of life, then you could potentially argue that crimes against humanity have occurred and then uh, the norm uh, may apply. But the, the process of consolidating the norm also is important in relation to these cases which are not relevant for the 
Georgia, the, the Georgia-Russian war is another case in which the norm was trying to apply. And again, the center, the special advisor, and other actors very vocally objected to that application of the norm. So uh, that, those instances are, are crucial for building the legitimacy of the norm, as will be the process of implementing and applying the norm, as is the case with human rights generally. In Guinea, we have just heard uh, the, the French government referring to the response in Guinea as a response inspired in, in R2P. And just yesterday, the Secretary General issued a statement in which he also mentioned that the government of Guinea has a responsibility to protect, which in this case may involve a responsibility to ask for assistance and to receive and accept that assistance. Monica gave us a lot of examples of different interpretations of when R2P would be applied. Who should decide, Steve, when this norm should be applied? Is it just the UN? And if so, who in the UN? Should it be the Security Council only? Would the US want to invoke this norm in order to uh, prevent mass atrocities? Uh, and, and what is, what is the status of the who decides question? Well, I mean, we have to do it flexibly. And, and of course, we start with this principle that it's, it's the country itself that, that should be identifying the problem and dealing with it. Uh, and then through, uh, through UN organs and organizations and, and, and regional ones as well, uh, efforts can be made to, uh, to deal with the problem uh, and to respond to it you know, in ways that will prevent the, the atrocity. At the, end of the, at the end of the spectrum, we all know, uh, lies the, the Security Council and the possibility that the Security Council could, under, under Chapter 7, uh, uh, make an enforcement action. Uh, but that's only really the, essentially the, the last resort. Uh, but, but, but fundamentally, I mean, one of the important things about the, about the responsibility of this act, even though Chapter 7 speaks to international peace and security as the reason for Security Council, Invocation, but the but the, the statement uh, unanimously uh, by the United Nations, including the United States, Russia, China, other countries, uh, that uh, there was this obligation for direct action uh, in the last resort, uh, suggests that the Security Council could act in one of these situations uh, to, uh, to, uh, to 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 intervene and, and, and prevent it, uh, or to protect uh, to prevent the atrocity or, or to protect uh, individuals. Talking about uh, case studies, and, and one that, that I've been involved in uh, that is still uh, certainly a case in progress, as, as the Guinea one is, and, and where the words responsibility to protect probably weren't uttered explicitly was the situation in Kyrgyzstan. And, and that shows uh, you know, the operation of this idea in, in, a, in, in a very challenging part of the world, former part of, of, of the Soviet Union, a part of the Russia president in the cases within their sphere of privileged uh, interest, etc. That's not fully accepted, uh, but, but, but fundamentally, uh, you had uh, a disturbance, you had deadly violence, you had what their own president, the their own president described in June as, as the murder of perhaps as many as 2,000 people in a two or three day period uh, uh, in the south of, of, of that country. It, from further investigation, it appears to have been around 400. Uh, it, it, it happened very fast. Uh, in terms of stopping it while it was occurring, uh, it was difficult. Various uh, international leaders uh, spoke out and, and, uh, uh, and did, uh, did what they could to, to, uh, to send a message of, of, about their concern. Uh, and, and, and the other violence ended. Uh, but then the tension very much remained. And the possibility that it could become much worse, that it could explode again uh, between the views back in the Kurdish community in the south, that it could have uh, implications uh, uh, within the region. Uh, and, uh, and as we saw with Rwanda, uh, uh, it was massacres of, of hundreds in, the, in 91, 92, 93 that led to the idea by the sponsors of the genocide in 94 that they could do it and, and, and get away with it. And so uh, the world response to a large extent was to, to try to assist the Kyrgyz government and also to, to bring civilians and others into the country for humanitarian reasons, but also 
uh, to assist enforcement. There's been this police advisory group mission, which hasn't been deployed yet, sponsored by the OCE, which we hope will soon uh, be there, uh, as, as eyes on the ground and, and, uh, and, and working on this issue. Uh, there's been pressure uh, for an international inquiry uh, in terms of what happened. Uh, an international commission has, has now been appointed uh, with, uh, with many participants of the UN and other organizations, and it's now deployed uh, in the South, and will soon make a report about who is responsible, and, and in the process send a very clear signal that uh, if, you know, if, if you do this again, there can be, there can be consequences. Uh, that's involved uh, uh, regional organizations like the OSCE. It, it's involved, uh, in a way, the United Nations, where there have been discussions and, and some uh, participation of, of the UN Human Rights uh, Office in, in providing people for, the, for this uh, mission. It's involved uh, other uh, uh, regional organizations. But, uh, but uh, it's, it's, I think, the, the way in which these situations will develop much more likely than the possibility that we'll have a security council. Uh, taking actions and some kind of a, a peacekeeping group by, by a resolution of the chapter 7. Monica, I wonder, uh, oh, before we get to the next question, we're almost at a point where we're going to open it up and have questions for you. So if you have any questions, please line up uh, uh, at the two mics. Uh, and in the meantime, I'd like to ask you, uh, could this norm actually hurt people and be used by governments which actually are the perpetrators of atrocities to uh, stave off intervention. In other words, there's a three-step project to the process here. And they could say, well, we've done step one. <coughs> step two says if the there's a capacity problem, the international community is obligated to build capacity. And they could just say, I just don't have the capacity. Let's talk about capacity. And in the meantime, they continue killing people. How do you get around that problem where you create a normative structure that has a step-by-step -step process? <coughs> in the meantime, when these kinds of atrocities break out, they're usually very rapid. Um, and somebody who really wants to commit ethnic cleansing or genocide could continue killing. I remember Milosevic said uh, when there was a threat of NATO intervention, uh, a village a day will keep NATO away. Uh, so if you want to perpetrate these atrocities, do it slowly, if you do it fast, then it's going to be a Russian intervention. So people can manipulate this and it could actually be counterproductive. How do we avoid that? Yeah, I, I think that you pointed to one of the tricky uh, challenges that our group faces. And the reverse could be said, I can provide you with exactly the opposite the scenario in which if we remember Kosovo, for instance, the human rights violations uh, were pointed very clearly to what we now would associate with an R2P scenario. 45% of the Albanian population in a matter of days lost their jobs. Children were segregated in schools. The Albanian children were only allowed to attend school at night uh, shifts. And, and yet, all the human rights protests that was going on in Kosovo was not sufficient to trigger the international response that was needed. And, and in turn, in a way, provided the perverse incentives for uh, some sectors, in particular the KLA, and, and the willingness of the younger Albanians to uh, become involved in the KLA. So it can play both ways. But I, uh, I genuinely believe that to the extent that we are serious about prevention, when a situation like the one you mentioned occurs, then you will have the legitimacy to say this is unacceptable and to respond quickly and, and swiftly. Without that dimension, which obviously would not be feasible in the scenario that you described, it would have to be, but it's about really uh, working very hard as any norm would do norms, in the end, are about trying to shape behavior. And in that sense, the responsibility to protect aims at building institutions, promoting values and attitudes that help remove the incidence of the crimes and that help also mobilize the political will across sectors and across borders to respond to these challenges as they arise. 
But you need, it's not in a segmented, it's not a sequence. And that is very important. We are not talking here about a sequence in which you try this, if it fails this. It has to be an ongoing process. And the idea of pillar one, the responsibility to protect is an ongoing responsibility. But there are difficult and complex questions that the norm will have to deal with as it evolves and consolidates over time. Are there any questions from the audience? Well, if not, I want to then go back to you, Steve, and Monica had mentioned political will. For this norm to be operational, there has to be sufficient political will, not just in one country, but in uh, several countries, uh, to really enforce this. Do you think we're at that point now? Well, we're moving in that direction. I mean, and, and, and again, I fall back on my own experience in, in international or criminal law. When Charles Taylor was allowed to go to, to essentially a safe and comfortable exile in, in Nigeria in 2003, which had the effect of getting him out of power or without, without a firefight, uh, uh, the, the international uh, community, the NGOs, the human rights groups, and others uh, said this isn't sufficient. Uh, this, this individual is responsible for mass atrocities. They need to face accountability. And, Civil society in Nigeria the, attempted to prosecute and resolutions passed in Congress 431 and, and then the European Parliament unanimously calling for, for, for this to change and, and finally with the election of a, of a democratic government in, in Liberia and, and the call for Nigeria Can you to speak up, please? Excuse me. And the, uh, and the involvement of uh, President Bush in refusing to meet President Abbasanjo. Uh, uh, it was uh, in, until Taylor was arrested. It was possible to, to bring him to justice. And, and it's, that, it's that sort of civil society, sort of international dynamic of, of people demanding that, uh, uh, that there be accountability for these crimes, I think transfers as well to civil society saying things have to be done. And, and they push their governments uh, in, in, in this direction. But uh, critics would say, why didn't we intervene while the atrocities were going on? Why did we wait and say, okay, one individual is held accountable? The heart and soul of our GDP is prevention. So is there political will now to intervene in a country that is experiencing this, these kinds of atrocities uh, in such a way that they can stop? I mean, we had the example of Kenya, but that was a diplomatic intervention that worked after a thousand people were killed. Many more couldn't have been killed in the election crisis. But in the case of Liberia, we had an ongoing insurgency renewed. Charles Taylor was, was behind it, and yet no one intervened uh, to, to stop the atrocities until after they were shot. Well, it, the issue of political will is, is a challenging one when it comes to putting boots on the ground, when it comes to uh, putting uh, American servicemen and women or, or others uh, in, in harm's way. I mean, we saw the, the impact on Rwanda of, of the Black Hawk Down incident in, in Somalia. And, uh, and we've obviously had the experience of, of being involved in a, in, a, in a period of time during our uh, uh, presence in, in Iraq when there was a civil conflict and an insurgency. And, uh, and, and so I think the, the sort of political will to get involved in these situations uh, uh, directly and, and with force uh, may be no stronger now than, than it has been in the past. So we know that that, that challenge is there for all of us, uh, even in the Rwandan situation, even though the, the world tried to hide from the fact that it was genocide for 45 days or so. By the middle of May, they called for the establishment of a 5,500 person uh, peacekeeping force to go in there, and no country wanted to volunteer uh, to, to go into that, to that situation. So the UN was ready with, at that point with a, with a Chapter 7 a mandate. So that's, though that would be the challenge. Uh, the, the, this is why uh, these other methods, uh, imperfect uh, as they are, the sort of the, uh, the, the kind of diplomatic interventions uh, you can make, the kind of uh, recognition that you can say that those who are responsible for these atrocities will face justice, not today, but uh, tomorrow or sometime in the future. Uh, efforts to, uh, uh, to, to monitor the situation, to use the diplomatic uh, tools that are, that are there, and also to work regionally. I mean, uh, we criticized the African Union in a lot of respects uh, recently. I mean, Debate over Bashir and the ICC. The African Union uh, has, a, has a peace and security council, has a, a robust mandate, has a R2P in its charter, even before it was internationally. Intervene, uh, uh, not 
was under the African Union, but within the regional uh, grouping of ECOWAS, uh, intervened uh, in Liberia, intervened in, uh, uh, in um, Sierra Leone in 92 and 97, uh, and, and, and had an effect uh, in terms of ending the atrocities there. Uh, others, however, as, as we know in the case of Sierra Leone, it took a, a UN mandated mission and also a, a unilateral uh, uh, expedition by, by the British uh, in the end to, to end that, and, and, and all the world uh, uh, understood that and, 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 and basically supported it. Uh, but those are the kind of intermediate steps that I think we're talking about before we're discussing the possibility of a Chapter 7 mission that would, that would go in and, and try to separate uh, uh, the, uh, the butchers from the victims. Let's go to the audience now. We'll start over here. Sky Force from Colorado Springs and the best just to follow up really on the comments that you made. I mean, the most glaring example perhaps today of a failure of this is the inability of states to follow through with it is in Darfur, where the African Union basically is able to monitor and observe can't be. But my question is more broadly, our, our warning discussions were about the capacity of the United States to remain engaged, but frankly, an appetite for intervention is not something that's going to be high on anybody's list in the near term. So could you talk a little bit more about, A, from the U.S. standpoint, the extent to which this co concept becomes at all attractive? It's always been a little bit unattractive. But secondly, for the rest of the international community, their capacity to respond, or is it really a question of, well, if it's going to be boots on the ground, it's got to be the United States. So how do we get around that problem of the declining appetite within the United States? Well, and, and, and I think the idea that if it's boots on the ground, it has to be the United States is, 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 is really a, a last resort, and as I discussed in the case of West Africa, I think it's the Nigeria and Kenya and, and uh, Senegalese and other Moroccan uh, boots on the ground that help bring peace in those kinds of situations. And as you look at who participates in, in peacekeeping forces, many of which now have, like the one in New York City, uh, Chapter 7 mandates for civilian protection, uh, uh, we're not uh, involved except in a very supportive role uh, for, for those kind of operations. Uh, I do think that, that uh, the sort of uh, awareness of Americans about atrocities uh, and, and and the desire to, to see effective action against them is, is very strong and very bipartisan. I can mean, see the, the Human Rights uh, Caucus in the, in the House uh, 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 and, and similar groups in the Senate, and, and the, the Republicans are as strong as the, as the Democrats on, on, these, on, on these issues, as we saw in Charles Taylor, as, he, as we saw in, in the decision uh, by the Bush administration to uh, acquiesce in a referral of Darfur to the ICC, despite the attitudes on the ICC. So, but I, but I think uh, it, from, from our position, it's going to involve uh, supporting uh, others uh, to make these things, uh, to make these things happen. And, and to, to reinforce the efforts of regional actors. And of course, in that respect, it's easier to build the support and for this not to appear of like, the, like you know, the opponents of RTP view it as something sort of uh, that justifies humanitarian or as they would want to say, neo-colonialist kinds of, of interventions. It's, and, and to, to focus it down at that level and to, and to be ready to, to help, I think, is, is, the, is the most that we're talking about from our point of view at this stage. Yeah, um, I just want to say that I totally agree and that, like other human rights norm, norms, um, the responsibility to protect will face a challenge of selectivity and is more likely to be activated where strategic interests are at stake. Um, however, like other human rights norms, the logic of r to p is to set up a virtuous circle of pressure, peer pressure, mobilization, and persuasion that can increase the cost of inaction. And I can point to an example in which, in this country, despite the strategic interest and the closeness of the relationship with the Pinochet regime, Precisely that dynamic forced very early on the U.S. government to condition military aid to the Pinochet regime and created that shift in political attitudes and political uh, culture that made possible the changes that we've seen in Latin America 
which include the most progressive jurisprudence in crimes against humanity even before the ICC and includes also the highest rate of transitional court cases in national courts in the world, 33%, and includes also the extradition of ex-heads of the state. So this is all the result of what experts call strategic advocacy networks that involve like-minded governments, non entrepreneurs, NGOs, human rights organizations, and all those who perceive to have a stake and, 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 and that consider that these crimes should not and cannot be tolerated. So you're suggesting that um, even the use of economic sanctions, for example, the sanctions that were passed against apartheid in South Africa, are consistent with R2P, because it doesn't always have to be military intervention. Any intervention in defense of human rights where large-scale human rights violations are occurring um, could fit into that movement. They could, but we have to be careful that we don't fall into the wider human rights uh, domain, because then there will be a trade-off with a more pressing situation. So, but I honestly and I personally believe that what R2P does is to highlight and to bring added political dimension to the quest against atrocity crimes, whether they are perpetrated on the radar and on a more chronic uh, in a more chronic kind of way, as seems to be the case, as is the case in Burma, not as is the case in Burma, and in other places, or whether it's a kind of massive rampant violence, like the one you mentioned before, like the one we saw in Burma. We have time for one last question. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Art McAfee from Santa Fe, New Mexico. And this morning we heard about the emergence of China. And we heard about China's national interest investing for natural resources in various countries in Africa and throughout Asia. What role has uh, China played in this, um, this initiative? Because uh, uh, when we were at the uh, leadership mission in November in, in Shanghai and Beijing, we heard about their very strong opposition to intervention in the affairs of other countries. Uh, we heard the words persuasion when we were talking about uh, Sudan, and we heard the words dissuasion when they were talking about North Korea's nuclear ambitions. But we never got any impression that they'd be willing to join any initiative that would involve intervention in another country. So I just wonder if you could expand on that. They not been thrilled by intervention and those by the responsibility to protect. But significantly, China endures with uh, many other heads of state, with a majority of heads of state, the 205 commitment. And uh, systematically, China has uh, responded in the debates and participated in the debates in a very nuanced and careful way. The 205 agreement was understood at the time as an agreement to disagree, but as a strategy of the Secretary General, very carefully crafted by <coughs> his special advisor shows, the agreement contained the elements to enable the community of committed member states to try to expand the scope and to push the normative vote. Uh, the normative vote. So my impression, and we've seen this with other powerful actors, including Japan, is that the, the behavior and the attitude of China towards the responsibility to protect, as is the case with other uh, emerging powers, Brazil, for instance, will very much depend on the capacity of that committed constituency to increase the cost of inaction. Of inaction. China has been problematic in Sudan, no doubt about it, no one can deny it. But there is also the understanding that pressure can be exerted on China and the political cost could be increased, but it's a challenge.
So we still have a long way to go on this emergent norm. And we all agree it is an emergent norm. But I would like to just leave you with one concluding thought. And that is that if we had R2P in effect in the 20th century, we might have been able to reduce, if not avoid, the mass atrocities that were committed by Hitler, Stalin, and Mao Zedong, where no one was at, at any norm, any legal basis for protesting uh, about what they did to their own citizens. So with that thought, I think we've made some progress from the 20th to the 21st century. But thank you very much, both of you. Thank you.